So one of the most common and uh, really kind of pernicious uh, points of contention that come up politically is the, whether or not the construction of a border wall is something that should be pursued. And uh, interestingly, the, the, this issue uh, tends to bypass uh, many kind of uh, political uh, dogmas. So you'll see a convergence often and an agreement between uh, kind of your libertarians uh, and also your Marxists, your uh, communists, and leftists, more generally, uh, Democrats. <clears throat> now, what's interesting about this, though, uh, is this is a, a position that libertarians really should not agree, uh, at least as far as basic philosophy goes. So we're going to examine the idea of a, a border wall, which should really just be understood as a secure border. Uh, of a sovereign state, uh, and how that fits within uh, the natural rights theory, and also if that qualifies as a function of good government as it was understood at the founding, uh, and I argue should continue to be understood today. Usually this subject is broached with issues like Funding, or which is kind of a joke if you consider all the silly things that the federal government uh, doles out cash for in lump sums. Uh, but usually it's around funding or some strange notion that a, a wall is racist or which is silly because it's a wall. It cannot be racist. It's anthropomorphic fallacy at its finest there, almost as good as guns. But... Uh, to, to start this discussion, we let's establish first uh, what is the function of good government? You know, what, what exactly is it that makes a government good or bad? So this is something, of course, that was explored exhaustively by ancient and classical and, and enlightenment thinkers alike. Uh, the first and most noble function of good government is the protection of private property. Uh, this is uh, this was understood by the likes of Locke, Bastiat, uh, and many others. And of course, Locke was uh, next to Aristotle the most influential figure in the founding doctrine. So take this along the conceptions of good government uh, that were also proposed by Aristotle, Plato, Thomas Aquinas, and others. Uh, where good a government was supposed to arrange itself and pursue policies that were to the greatest advantage of those it governed. You know, where, where government went awry was when it began to uh, act in such a way and pursue policies that benefited those in power over those who were governed. So if we kind of combine those, those ideas together, uh, then we can reasonably say that good government then uh, is a government that pursues policies that are to the advantages of its citizens over itself within the bounds and restrictions of individual liberty and constitutional governance. Uh, although it's, it's very uh, common, uh, we should apply the constitutional test to any and all actions performed by government, uh, since that is, uh, well, it's the rule book of how they're supposed to uh, function. Now, what's very important to include in this little uh, matrix, however, is that, uh, and this is unique to American government, uh, at least as far as how it was founded, uh, was that uh, the American doctrine or such is the government has no power of its own. Uh, it is actually a conduit of the natural liberty of those that it governs. So... Governments don't have power; they have an authority. Uh, you know, Locke explains that uh, a governed people they loan uh, or bestow, or one might even say sacrifice, uh, some of their natural liberties. If you imagine mankind in the freest state possible, uh, to the government, in order for the government to then uh, fulfill its functions and roles. So government actually gains authority 
from the governed. It doesn't give rights to people. That's why natural rights are protections from government and against society. So since the government gains its authority from the, uh, the natural rights, essentially, of the governed, it has a responsibility and obligation to those people from which it acquires its authority. Uh, so these responsibilities, which I prefer to call obligations, uh, kind of in uh, a bit of a tip of the hat again to the Lockean thought that um, natural rights are not just reciprocal rights among individuals, but also reciprocal obligations. Uh, but this can be understood, then, as a reflection of those same natural rights. So, to phrase it differently, uh, a nation has as much of a right or responsibility, in, in my reckoning, uh, to ensure the preservation of life of its, in a similar fashion that people do. So this is where uh, good government then is responsible for defending itself, and itself then is the people. And this was a, a very uh, blatantly recognized truism, uh, even in the Constitution, uh, which was designed in part two, as you might uh recognize, uh, to provide for the common defense. Uh, and this was uh, further elucidated in Section 8 uh, when Congress is specifically enumerated with the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So the founders understood at the inception of the Constitution that the federal government uh, was a government-possessed uh, power only because it was vested into it by the people. Uh, but as a consequence, it had a responsibility to protect the nation in much the same way uh, that the principal purpose of government was the protection of private property. So it bears repeating, though, that private property included self-possession. Life and the capacity to defend and preserve that life. It also includes your intellect, the products of your intellectual labor. Uh, oftentimes, uh, leftist ideologies will try to attach some type of absurd materialistic worship to the idea of private property. Uh, but that, it, that involves uh, ignoring the clear definition as it was understood at the time uh, and th really throughout time. It's not just you own your home, for example. Uh, you own yourself, you own your thoughts, you own your religion, you own your speech. Uh, these all sound familiar. That's because of these protections were enshrined, particularly uh, in the Constitution, and for that exact reason. Uh, but so, so authorized, of course, then. Uh, the government was authorized implicitly through the theory of natural rights and the founding understanding of good government, but it was also authorized explicitly through the Constitution there in Section 8. So the federal government not only has a right to protect its citizens through securing its borders, but it has an obligation to do so. Uh, and, the, of course, it, it has this right or obligation in much the same way that you have the uh, right to build a fence around your property, to have locked doors and windows, uh, and just generally to control who you allow into your home or onto your property. Uh, this is not a uh, extreme argument at all. Uh, as a extension of its citizens, uh, then a sovereign state, just as the citizens have a right to protect their property, uh, so, for does, so does the state. It's really not uh, far more complicated than that. <clears throat> But again, I, I would reiterate that it's not only allowable and permissible, not only under natural rights theory and founding doctrine, but Section 8 of the Constitution, but it should be considered an obligation of the federal government. Uh, so individuals, you know, you and I, we can choose whether or not we really want to uh, follow our natural rights. Uh, maybe, maybe I own a home. Maybe I don't want to lock my door. Maybe I don't want to lock my car. Maybe I don't want to build a fence. And that's fine. I have that volition. However, the federal government does not have the uh, ability to selectively choose which one of its obligations it fulfills. 
So because it's trusted with that authority, it is obligated to make good on that requirement in the pursuit of good government. So a government that's designed and empowered through this mechanism, which is unique to America, hence American exceptionalism, that the government only derives its powers from the people it governs. It doesn't have the freedom to choose whether or not uh, it gets to uh, fulfill its obligations. So consider uh, national defense more generally in a kind of a more, uh, I guess, more obvious kind of application here. If the federal government decided tomorrow to no longer have a Navy, Army, military, or any type of national defense, uh, and to eliminate all of its weapons and everything else, uh, that, that might cause some eyebrows to raise. And that's because, specifically, the government then is failing in its obligation. So, granted, we are ignoring or omitting uh, many of the arguments that sometimes surround uh, the idea of border security. Uh, but just examined through natural rights theory, and especially as that applies uh, to the unique governmental structure um, and even the, the concepts of good government reaching as far back as Aristotle, uh, border security is, is not only a function of good government, uh, but it's obligatory because of the powers vested in the government uh, through those people uh, that are uh, governed. Uh, so thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, please subscribe, leave a five-star review, and tell a friend, or ten, and visit 1787project.com uh, to learn more.